Hello, everybody. It's David Knight. It's the OK Boomer Show, and we have got some super special guests here. Both, this is how they looked a couple of years ago on the photo, and then we have them live as well. So, Johnny McLean from Sydney, Australia. How are you? G'day, Dave. Good, mate. G'day, mate. That's an Australian accent. And we have another Aussie in the room, Mr. Famous Greg Welsh from yeah. California. I no, no, mate. I'm from Sydney, Australia. Okay, I'm in California. You're right? in Cali. You win that one. You win that one. <laughs> well, your accent hasn't changed, thank goodness, right? Yeah, well, they say I've got a little twang, but... A little twang. Do. Yeah. You've got more of a twang than what I do, and I've been here 31 years. 31 years. Shit, I've only been here 20, so... <laughs> Who knows? Hey, mate, great to get you both on the line. Uh, again, OK Boomer, we're going into a little bit about John's book, Change, A Constant Challenge. We've gone through the five M's, and so if you haven't bought the book, go to, to the link below, and you'll see a way to buy it on Amazon. And then uh, what's been more important is we've been digging into the fraternity um, of Iron Man, and uh, we had Bob Babbitt last week, Lou Friedland the week before, and Wendy Ingram. And now we have Greg Welsh, who's the Australian that crossed the line in Kona World Championship. What was that, 97? 94. 94. See, I totally screwed that up. I, I told you we had no fact checkers Good to on this you show. Did your research. 94. Yeah, well, I can't read because <laughs> you told me to take my glasses off, so I can't read. It's four is a seven. Anyways. Johnny, there's no doubt about it, mate. Greg, how are you, buddy? <laughs> I'm great. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just. Sitting on the couch, I had a little shoulder surgery uh, two weeks ago, so I'm just sort of nursing that at the moment. So okay. I'm, I'm pretty relaxed. All well, good. Put some ligaments back together. What'd you do? Yeah. Oh, well, it was a silly surfing accident. Happened back in April, but um, yeah, I tore my rotator cuff and the biceps tendon, but it's all good to go. Hey, Did stitches, stitches and staples. That's morning. what we're all about. More, came more out scars. So more scars. Yep. Yeah. Speaking of yeah, scars. Speaking of scars, you've got a few <laughs> scars, Mr. McLean. Oh, thanks for the segue. <laughs> yeah, there's a few uh, identifying scars that uh, we uh, we got during a bike ride many years ago, Greg. Um, but uh, let's move on, Dave. Yeah, no worries. So uh, the theme of this is just to like connect, talk about stuff. Um, so, uh, Greg, do you remember when you met John? Yeah, I met John. Um, I think it was soon after ninety. Three-ish, ninety-four, I believe, um, right around when I did win Kona, or maybe the year after I won Kona. But um, I knew about John's story, um, you know, because well, firstly, you know, I played rugby league growing up, and then secondly, you know, when a, an horrific accident, like or a catastrophic accident such as John's happens, um, the whole world takes takes note, and um, you know, when especially in a very small fraternity such as the triathlon fraternity, um, you know, you you hear about it immediately and um, yeah so uh, but John's done so many great things since then so he he became an inspiration to me um, and you know we've had a good friendship ever since and you're a Cronulla boy right yeah well you can take the boy out of Cronulla but you can't bring the panther to Cronulla so I'm, you know just uh, <laughs> well hang on, uh, hang on. anyway uh, half the world hang doesn't on. know about well, that who's, yeah. who's on the, who's sharks versus panthers what's are we going to have well, a bet on. on the rugby league now hang on we won Greg, the premiership actually... a couple of years ago <laughs> Greg I was born in Cronulla hospital really born, yeah born in Cronulla hospital unfortunately uh, parents migrated west to grow up in Mount Druitt um, I was zero <laughs> or one of them <laughs> I wasn't yet one, so I didn't have much say, but uh, uh, I'm a big fan of Cronulla. Oh, that's awesome. great. Yeah, we, we're a big fan of you, mate. You can come and get, grab the surf any time you like, brother. That's hey, awesome. um, I wanted to ask a question around Nepean because that was my first introduction into uh, triathlon. Can you share with, with us your introduction to the sport? And then, because if my memory serves me, I think you might have cleaned up in races right around the world, including Nepean. Is that is that right? Yeah, race Nepean, I think. I think once I won it. Um, I had a deficit getting off the bike to Brad Bevan, of course, my my good friend and the croc. Uh, my rival, the, the croc. croc. Yeah, <laughs> the croc. you and I, Johnny, are having a nice conversation here in the drinker in the in the back. You know, he's just you just drink your lemon juice there, Dave. We're just having a little talk here. Yeah? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so anyway, up and down those beautiful hills of the streets, um, you know, down down there in um, 
Oh gosh, what was it? Uh, what was the other side of the river called there? Uh, yeah, yeah. So Johnny? on the other side, you go into Emu Plains. Emu Plains. Emu. That's right. So up into Emu Plains and just all around, you know, just on the Nepean River. Absolutely gorgeous race. I loved it, and it's still going. I think it's Australia's. Is it Australia's oldest race right now? Correct. Yeah. So it uh, yeah. that is the first triathlon that was ever uh, had it ever taken place, and obviously, you know. So many people that have gone on to be a part of that, including the Chapmans, Greg and Bronwyn and, uh, and the boys with, uh, with Trent, who went on to race with you and uh, as part of the St. George. You know, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but can you kick off uh, your introduction to sport and health and fitness, Greg? How did, how did that start for you? Yeah, um, just go back to, just wanted to finish off with Corey. Don't leave Corey out of there. Warwick Brennan, you know, with the, the whole race director and just what a foresight that those guys had. And yeah, Trent was bloody awesome. He was such a great athlete. Um, the old man, not so much. Oops, sorry, Greg. Um, anyway, yeah, I got started in sports. Uh, you know what? I was like, I played rugby league since I was five years old. So I was knee high to a grasshopper so I was always like a reserve or you know peeling the oranges at half time or cutting them and anyway so I did get a start in rugby league uh, around about fourth class um, started doing you know the um, the races around the track at the you know at the carnival and uh, in fifth grade uh, as a matter of fact I actually won the 800 meters outright um, and they're like, whoa, how can a little kid like you win, you know, a two-lap race around the Oval and run that fast? It's only because I got to uh, to rugby league practice early and my coach just made me just do, you know, laps until everyone turned up. So, <laughs> yeah, anyway, that's how I got my start. I, I followed that up with cross-country running, going into high school, and then everything just seemed to, you know, sort of like snowball from there. And what, what was your first triathlon? How did you get into tries? Um, I got into tries from my very good friend at the surf club, Richard Walker. Um, Richard was a um, great lifesaver, fantastic swimmer, started doing triathlon, um, and he just told me he was going down to the National Park to do a, uh, a triathlon, you know, this, this particular weekend. So I said, oh, I'll, go down and, uh, I'll go down and watch you. So I ran there from my place. It was about 14K to get there, and I was so psyched on the way uh, way home he's like come on dude i'll drop you home and i'm like no i'm gonna run home <laughs> so i ran and plus i ran like halfway out on the run course that day and the run course that day i think was like 17k or something so i almost did a marathon just watching this thing and you know two weeks later i did my first triathlon where was that um lake illawarra 1985 okay did you clean up how old were you and how did you go funny story um there was i think that there was well over a thousand people in it um my time for my mile in the swim was like 32 minutes so terrible i got out of the water like 900 um rode my bike into about 600 place or something and i fished finished sorry finished in around about 90 second or something like that fastest run of the day <laughs> oh wow there you go yeah was that always your strongest leg yeah for sure much yeah. faster than john yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. So did, you, did, did that then take you to to school athletics carnivals, running? You know, yeah. what is it? Uh, local, then into zone, district, state. Is that? Yeah, yeah. That's that's exactly how it happened, John. And I think my best placing in cross country was fourth place in the CHS in in, in New South Wales. Uh, in my first year, so that would have been 1977, um, when that was at Hurlston Ag. Um, you know, just outside of Liverpool there. So up and down those monster hills, it was fantastic course. And But there was quite a lot of good runners, you know, at, at that time in, in my age group and, and stuff. So, yeah, that's how I got started. And then, you know, I just went on to other things. I'd surfed all my life and, you know, I started playing squash at a young age as well. So I went to, I was, I was good at the Australian level, but that was about it um, at squash. Um, and then played a little bit of tennis, but I'm, I'm just a sports jock, so I'd do anything. Did you were you doing something as well from a, a career perspective around a trade? Was there some interest in that? Yeah, as well. <laughs> well, Can yeah, you share I mean, that? I, I, yeah, sure. I left school at uh, you know at year ten, so I didn't go on to do my HSC or anything like that. Um, got offered a job, you know, an apprenticeship as a, a plasterer or gyp rocker, whatever you want to call, and um, and that was fantastic because it was only a week uh, a month at 
at tech. So I go to, you know, tech one week a month and I'd work the other three weeks, but I'd get up early. I'd go ride my bike before work and then head off to work. And then after work, it was funny because I'd go straight to the pool and then run after the, the swim session. But I get to the pool and George, he was the, um, the uh, superintendent of Sutherland uh, pool at the time. And, and uh, I'd always walk in white, white as a ghost. I had plaster all over me. I was sanding and just crap everywhere. I was just, just an ugly individual, right? I come into this uh, pool and George is like, you know why I like you so much? He goes, you test my filtration system and it works. <laughs> so, so, so you're swimming down the lap with a white stream of uh, yeah. dust behind you in the pool. Yeah, That's hilarious. yeah, I was. So, um, yeah, that was a, that was a funny thing. Yeah. So when did you transition between a jip rocker and saying, you know, I can make a go at this sport? Okay, that's a good story too and great question. You know, um, right at that time, I, um, in 1989, I'm, you know, I'm well into my trade and everything and, you know, uh, doing well. I'm working six days a week. The, you know, the six day a week was really helping me out, you know, with, with rent or board and then a little bit of money in the bank so I could, you know, go to some races uh, in the state of New South Wales. But then I, I, I actually started doing very well and uh, I got offered to go on an Australian team to Avignon. It was the very first uh, world championships at Olympic distance um, in August of 89. So we went on a trip that entailed two races in France, one in Germany, and then the world championships in France, straight over to race in Canada, back to the US, one back in Canada and then home. And then five weeks later was the Ironman when I was still an age grouper. But, I was given the opportunity to do this because my my employer, which was Plaster Linings at the time, Arthur Blizzard, bless his heart, he died in 1995, um, gave me the opportunity. He was the president of the ACU at the time, the Auto Cycle Union, so he looked after Mick Doohan, Wayne Gardner, guys like that. He gave them the, their first rides in international level. So he's like, Greg, I can see it. I can see a trend. You're actually getting pretty good at this. So. You know, your, your job safe. So if you want to go across, you know, the other side of the world and try it, go ahead and come home and your job's here. So I went away and I never came back. <laughs> Sorry, Arthur. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. how it happened. And, well, it's uh, great yeah, that he so. gave you that opportunity, right? And gave you that comfort that go and spread yeah. your wings and try something and make a go of it. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen a lot like that. But, um, yeah, he just saw something and I'm just... Um, yeah, I'm very, uh, very grateful for the opportunity. Awesome. Greg, one of the things that separates you, in my opinion, I'm sure Dave would concur, that you were able to compete from a sprint right through to Ironman. So very few athletes, I mean, they're so sport specific these days. Um, when did you kind of, I mean, I'll, I, let me take a step back. My first uh, introduction to you, and I used to love watching Ironman on Wild Water Sports back in the day, you might recall, you know, Channel 9. And, you know, obviously watching you race in those early, in the early 90s, but the thing that really stuck out for me was, you know, 94, because I had done the Nepean, the Nepean triathlon as a wheelchair uh, athlete. And here I am watching Kona, um, and Aussie gets up, a little guy called Welshie. So that was a really big, a big thing for me, right? Because Show that finished photo, that. Josh. Just flash it yeah. up there. Give everyone another look. <laughs> here he is. Was, there oh, he is. Yeah. That's dead sexy right there. Where's the one him jumping up in the air? I like that, the other one. Don't do that. You might see my Jets crackers popping out the side of my um, speedos. <laughs> that's well, that's Aussie, Aussie, that's Aussie flag in your right hand. Yep. Yeah. Pretty, pretty special moment for you, Greg. Yeah, it was a really special moment. As a matter of fact, my dad up on the other corner, he handed me a flag, an Aussie flag, but it was huge. And I think that he, he ripped a fence post off somebody's face and he sort of banged it, you know, banged it on with a nail. And I was getting splinters in my arm. It was massive. I was about six foot long. I'm like, I can't hold this anymore. So I, I saw somebody else holding a smaller one, so I grabbed that. And I you just swapped it. One. Yeah, I swapped it out. But uh, anyway, I'm, I'm glad that I got to carry that down the finish line. Um, that day because, you know, it was a historic day in Ironman because it was the first time that a, not just an Australian won the event, but a non-American, you know, won the Ironman World Championships in Kona. So, yeah, great day. Can you, can you take us back your first Kona and let's kind of do a build up to that great day in 94? Yeah, so it all started in 1987. Um, it was the second year that 
the Foster, Tung Curry, Ironman, it was called the Great Lakes International Triathlon back in the time. Um, the first year, I, I want to say it was the Tui's, uh, anyway, whatever it was, but um, my one was the Rudy Hill RSL Great Lakes International Triathlon. <laughs> and I actually finished third uh, overall. I uh, had no idea. This One of my favorite stories of all time is this one. Um, it only had seven qualifying spots. I think there was three for men, three for women, and one other, however, it was divvied out, whatever. I got third, I qualified, I went. But this is how I got to the finish line. Had a good swim, uh, got out onto the bike ride. I was trying to eat everything that I possibly could, you know, because I was a, it was my first race, so I'm an iron virgin, right? Going through the bike, I start losing quite a few spots after about 140K with 40 kilometers left to, to ride. I go, at this time, uh, John and David, John, you'll probably remember this, maybe you too, David, uh, you used to go in to the Foster Tunker, uh, sorry, into the Foster Memorial Services Club, into the change rooms, into the men's change rooms there, you'd get changed, you'd take your bag in there, you'd upend it, you'd put your running gear on, and then you would run out. So I've gone in there, and I've noticed that Tony Southwell, and Chris Southwell, and John Southwell were all in there having a shower. And I'm like, what are you doing having a shower? They're like, oh, come and join us. We're just going to get freshened up before we head out on the run. You'll feel much better. And I'm like, <laughs> all right, makes sense. So I go in, I join them in the shower, and I start scrubbing away. And they're like, Welchie, we're pulling out of the race. Get going. Go put your clothes on and get going. <laughs> Those Southwell <laughs> boys, spending... they were in trouble, yeah. those guys. Big trouble, still are. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, so I ran out onto the race course and uh, I don't know what position I was in. It was like in the in the 30s probably, but, um, and the second best thing about that day is I ran past Glenn Forbes with about a 2K to go. To get Forbesy. Forbes so that was a great day. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cannibal. Who, who, by, who, by the way, is still not broken 10 hours for the Iron Man. Oh, really? He's going to love that. He's going to love that. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, there goes my there so goes my fun. cannibal sponsorship right there. Yeah, don't worry about it. I, I got a discount code for you, mate. You'll be all good. <laughs> so, well, she that then led into what you you got? You found yourself in Kona. Yeah, you know what, John? That that was it because that day when I qualified for Kona, I didn't have to you know requalify again because. It just so happened that, or in an outside race, you know, from Kona, because I went that year, I got fifth in my age group, and the top five in each age group qualified to go back each year. And then a year or two after that, it was your time, or I might have it around the wrong way. It was your time, and then it was your age group. So I never had to, you know, keep qualifying, because my third year, um, I was still an age grouper. I just got back from um, the World Championships in Avignon, uh, like the story I was telling you a moment ago. Um, go in there as, again, as an age group, and I got third place. You know, I'd beaten Tinley and Paulie Kiru and all these people, and it just so happened that Mark Allen won his first Kona that day, and he beat Dave Scott, and they were the two legends of the sport, the two guys to win six times. And um, I was in a different postal code when I finished, I will admit that, <laughs> but uh, I was third, and I was offered a big fat check that was more than what I earned in a year, as a plasterer. So I took it and turned pro. Wow. Gotcha. So I presume you didn't have a shower when you got off the bike. I did not. I did not. <laughs> I thought about it because it was a big ocean. It's called the Pacific Ocean. And it looked really nice and chill, you know, after, you know, just riding through the lava fields. But no, I'd always wanted to jump into the ocean there in a race, but I didn't get to. <laughs> I must admit, Greg, a couple of times in my races, I got off the bike, went into the, the medical tent and had a full, full massage <laughs> and an ice <laughs> down from the medical staff and lots of Gatorade. And they're just like, they're like, are you okay? I said, I feel fine now. <laughs> My support yeah. crew were outside, like, where is he? Is he okay? And I was just there having, like, <laughs> one person on each leg, having my back massage and an ice bucket on my head and feeling great. It was, it's a great way to actually transition. Not good for your time, but your, your health yeah. and mental well-being. It's pretty good. Yeah, John, I, I don't put it past Mr. Knight. I, he's sly <laughs> enough to do that, don't you think? <laughs> well, um, hey, Johnny, I don't I, know I've about had... you, mate, but I don't know about you, mate, but, like, I mean, most of the people go to Kona, right? They stay on Elite Drive, which is the main drag, and it goes up for about six and a half, seven miles with about, I don't know, what's that, 10K, 11K, uh, one way, and you come back. It's a beautiful run in the morning and in the afternoon, not so much in the middle of the day. And all the condominiums are pretty much spread out over Elite Drive. So a lot of people 
like yourself, would actually go into their condo, <laughs> have a little rest, have something nice to eat, come back out, join the course where they left it, right. and go on and finish the race. Yeah, I know. It's, I know. <laughs> it's a great way to look so, after yourself, right? If you're not, if you're not yeah. in the world champion stage and you're just an age grouper, it's like, I just want to finish this thing. It's a long day. Yeah. I do, have a, I do have a story of a guy that did go in there, watch a movie, <laughs> and then come out and then finish the race later. So he wasn't a fast guy, but yeah. he did that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's good. So yeah. Greg, Greg yeah. The Kona was your first race and you finished third, which is just epic. And then yeah, let's, so... let's, stay on, let's stay on the Ironman journey and then we'll, we'll come back to some of the other stuff. Sure. Yeah, so 87, I went there the first time. I was 45th in overall. I did nine hours and 45 minutes, and I was fifth in my age group. Uh, 1988, come back the second year, I won my age group. I did nine, I want to say I did like 9.15 or somewhere there. And then the next year was when I was third. This was the incredible year. But I put it down to this, John and Dave, is that when I went on that seven-race, eight-week tour, you know, to the World Championships, we were just training and racing hard every weekend. Uh, you know, Brad Bevan, Nick Croft, myself, Miles Stewart, Spot Anderson, uh, Todd Voss, that was our men's team, Sue Turner, Louise Bonham, and Carol Pickard was the women's team. So if you're, if you're nostalgic about, you know, Australian triathlon and history, you, you'll know those names. So basically, I went in there in really good shape. I just, I, I wasn't overtraining, but I was doing a lot of short course stuff. Come home those five weeks, I was running on Saturdays, I was running the Sand Hills in Cronulla, really hard workout after, you know, tough bike ride. Um, you know, then Sundays, back it up with a nice long run. Go into Kona in, in, in 89 and ended up going third place and eight hours and 32 minutes. Wow. First year with aero bars and clipless pedals. So it was really amazing. I mean, those those were the days. I mean, those those were the days where they actually kept your your time as an age group time. But uh, about five years later, they took all those age group times away. So nobody twenty two and a half years old has gone eight thirty two since that day. And that day was thirty years ago. Wow, wow, yeah. And then and then so between that, what happened the following year? What did you do? Yeah, so I got a little cocky. Um, I, 1990, I won my first World Championship Olympic distance uh, down in Orlando, uh, which was amazing because we, we finished um, right in um, Disney World. So we actually ran down the Main Street, like Main Street Disney World, to finish the World Championships, which is just crazy. I mean, while people are in there, you know, doing their thing and, and doing all the rides and seeing Mickey and Minnie, but Mickey and Minnie were at the finish line and they gave me my medal. Oh, so wow. that was there very important, very right. important to me. Nice. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, I went to Kona that year and I got fifth place. I thought I'd done enough work, but I, I think I was uh, a little on the light side of uh, the longer training. Um, 91, I got second place, so I'm starting to, you know, hit the straps, um, feeling as though I'm a contender now. I didn't really feel as though I was a contender until that year. 92, trained really well in uh, Boulder in Colorado, so now experimenting with altitude training, as I did in 91. Uh, worked in 91. In 92, it didn't work so much because I was work I was training a little bit too hard and not drinking enough and hydrating enough, and I actually burnt a slight hole in my colon. So, um, yeah, so in 92, I, ha I was slowed down and reduced to a walk, uh, got sixth place. 93, I was hit by a car two weeks out. I'd just done the World Duathlon Championships in Dallas and won that. It was my last uh, hit out. It was 14 days out from Kona. Uh, two days later, got cleaned up by a truck and uh, busted my left knee. And that was, uh, so needless to say, the rest of 93 and early part of 94 was rehab. And then in 94, I trained like a yeah man possessed and won. What a but great story. In in 93, Greg, did you not get out on one of the moped and kind of do a bit of reconnaissance and a bit of <laughs> learning around how you could improve? Is, 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 there, is there some truth in that story? Yeah, there's a lot of truth in that story. And thanks to Gatorade, they, they made that happen. So I went over there and um, I think it was a blessing in disguise because I actually got into the lead car, camera car, um, for the bike ride on the men's race. So I got to see how Mark raced it. And Mark being the Zen master, you know, he just, he just 
it, it was almost like, you know, he premeditated every one of those moves out there, and I, I stand firm by those words. And he was so patient, you know, and just did everything right. His nutrition was absolutely spot on. He he barely went to the front of any chase group or the, the lead group and did, did the pacemaking or anything like that. He just sat back and just, you know, waited until it was time to, to move. And just like a Tour de France rider, you know, on the, on the hills, they don't go with 5K to go. They go with 2K to go or 1K to go, and they, they get 15, 20 quick seconds there. So it was very calculated. So going back in 94, I was just really lucky to have that opportunity to, you know, learn from those things and probably learn from a few mistakes that I made, you know, in my early 20s, you know, when I was starting in, in the Ironman distance. So, yeah, so when I went into 94, I pretty much said, I'm, you're Mark Allen. Don't make any stupid moves. And... I could have made that stupid move that day in 94 because there was these preems, like fastest out of the water, uh, Timex preems that they put up and then at 85 miles on the bike ride and then halfway up uh, Polani Hill on the run. So at about 82 miles, um, Ken Glar just absolutely goes past us like a, a bull at a gate. And he was down there, he's, he's, he's pushing like 60 RPMs. This guy could push the biggest gear, but it was a slow cadence. And then straight after that was Jürgen Zach. They went for it. They were going for 1,500 bucks, right? And Dave Scott looks at me. I get up out of the saddle and I start to go. Dave Scott looks over and goes, Greg, Greg, Greg. No, 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 no. The real race is here. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, is he calling my bluff or do I go? And I'm like, okay, this guy's won the Ironman six times. I'm going to trust him that, yeah, that probably if that takes a little bit of, you know, too much zip out of my legs, uh, that's probably true. So just stay back, um, you know, and just get your Gatorade in and your, your fluids in and you'll be just fine. Get to the turner, uh, get to the end of the bike ride, which Johnny was up at um, – the Kona Surf at the time, which is now the Sheraton, right. seven miles out of town. Yeah, seven miles out of town. But you used, used to go up this huge hill, like we yeah. call it Heartbreak Hill, on the bike. And then once you parked your bike, you had to run out of it. Remember, John? Straight yep. up. It was like a cliff. Oh, like no, he remembers that. Face. <laughs> yeah, because he probably had to go backwards up it, right, Johnny? Yeah. So, yep. um, yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, just so you didn't do a wheelie, like with that front wheel. So, um, yeah, so anyway... We only came into the transition area 50 seconds down on these guys. So Kenny Glar was, you know, he was a quick fix, man. He got into his running shoes and he was gone. You know, he had those uh, you know, tight little speedos on and out of there. Jürgen Zach, however, he was still in the transition area when I ran out. So that was like I put a minute on him in the transition. Got the lead at about um, uh, 11K into it. I got that preem, went up Polani Hill, and that's where I kept the lead the whole way. But... Here, here's the kicker. When you've got someone like Dave Scott who's won the race six times and he's running behind you, and he was about 20 to 30 seconds behind that whole time, but this time you, you went out and you had two turnarounds. You had one at the airport, and you come back, you go into the energy lab, you had your second turnaround at the bottom of the energy lab, and then you would come back into town. So the first, the first turnaround, I, I, I press my watch, and by the time they come across, you just double it, right? And you, you get the time. So it was 11 seconds. I double it, 22 seconds, no worries. I go down to the energy lab, I turn around, press my watch, he comes by, 11 seconds, double it, 22 seconds. I didn't know that during that time, he pulled within 10 seconds of me and he started blowing and going out the back door at the same time. So when I turned around, I was like, oh gosh, the pressure's still on. But by the time I got to the top of um, the Queen Kaubana Highway and the yeah. energy lab, I had 52 seconds. Someone told me that, they caught up to me and, and told me that. And then I put four minutes on him on the way back into town. But it was a pressure-filled race. It was just fantastic to have that pressure the whole way. But when you're in the lead or when you're enjoying yourself, you just find that extra couple of inches in your step and um, or in your roll, you know, for Johnny. And um, you just go for it. It felt great. Well, um, I, I, let me jump in here, Greg, because this is where it really started to do a couple of things. One, that I looked to you straight away as a mentor. I hadn't yet had that opportunity to meet you. Um, but an Aussie won Kona, so that's epic. So I thought, you know, everything was kind of, because I'd done the PN, I'd done another race, and then I found out that after watching, you know, you win and John Franks take on uh, the course. John Franks. As a wheelchair yep. epic. I thought, maybe this is my opportunity to wave an Australian flag across the finish line like well she did. So that's how that kind of unfolded for me. Fast forward to 95, I lined up. 
um, staying in the same hotel as Nolene, your mother, um, was staying at. <laughs> and it was so beautiful as a, a fellow Aussies to spend some did time you get, together. Did she you get any your... sleep? Uh, <laughs> I'm still making up you for it today. You your ear off. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love, I, I love mum and dad. So as you know, they retired <laughs> to where my parents retired to as well in Cobra. Um, yep. But she gave me a poster of you. So I stuck my poster up in, on my wall and that kind of, you know, really started to cement an opportunity that I could potentially do that one day as well. So I did 95, you might recall, and had my Australian flag out, 96, and then finally got it right in 97. So, um, you know, yeah. thank you to you for opening the door for you know, Aussies to follow, and many have, um, but you're the first. Well, thanks, mate, and, and, and you put us on the map so much in Australia as well, just not only with your story, but the fight that you had and the will to just go back and, um, you know, when Sarah Reinitz did it, she's a, a single leg uh, amputee, you know, they called her uh, second go around unfinished business. And what I saw from you was a business that wasn't going to be finished until you got across that line. So, you know, that's something that I really, um, I really love about you, John. And, you know, we've been friends for a long time now, but uh, not only with you, but with the CAF and, and all that. But, um, yeah, what you've done uh, has really helped, you know, uh, all the para-athletes in Australia as well. And now I look at, you know, someone like Lauren Parker, who's, uh, look, I'm just going to point out one name. We have so many of them, but just one name. Lauren Parker doing things that she's doing right now. She's got a good chance to represent Australia next year at the Paralympics. And then her goal is to do something that John McLean did. And she knows John McLean very well too. So, you know, you've, you've had a huge impact um you know on our sport so i thank you for that too john well greg just a little bit on give me goosebumps buddy um but you know <laughs> dreams do come true so you know i wanted to be a footballer that was kind of my dream back in the day and obviously played reserve grade for penrith and and then obviously a truck come along to change my course and then to you know throw a new passion into a new sport so I would never have thought that I would have been sponsored by Mrs. T's with Tim Towards, you can recall, and Gatorade, <laughs> yeah. thanks to Dave, and, and all those kinds of things. So when I heard of Lauren Parker's accident, I got the opportunity mm -hmm. to meet her in the spinal unit, and I knew that there was something in common. Obviously, we both had accidents on our bikes and broke our backs. So she made it. I made a commitment to her in hospital. She said, I'm going back to Kona, and I'll need you at the finish line. So I said, when, when that day comes, oh. I'll, uh, I'll be there with, with Welshie, and we'll cheer across the line. <laughs> so it, it, it's nice to be in a position to open the doors for, for others to follow. And as you know, now, you know, any Ironman around the world, there is a wheelchair cat category. You have to make sure that it's accessible, 70.3, and all the way down to, you know, paratriathlon. So the sport's come a long way from, um, from watching you do uh, Hawaii in 1994. Uh, let's talk about some of your other achievements, buddy, because there are many. We could be here for a long time. We could. <laughs> well, um, let me so just finish the... off. Let, let me let me just finish off that because John, you, you're very very humble, but I think that without having you uh, do what you did in '95, six, and seven, it would have been hard to get to the point we're at right now. And I have to say thank you very much to Lou Friedland for believing in you and seeing something and having the foresight to create a category like that. So let's go on to the next stuff. Awesome. Nice um, plug. So what about, and then the, the big thing for me was, Greg, was when I got a chance to come back and start to watch some of the, well, let me think, Tui's Blue is what I recall at Penrith Panthers when they put a <laughs> pool in the, in the car park and obviously watching you as part of the St. George series. And off the back end of me doing Kona, it was so special to be on the sidelines to watch you go by doing that sprint stuff, you know, the, the, all the races there in Manly with the Brave Boys and stuff. So um, can you share some of that with us in terms of you, you, you could do the, the long stuff, but you could also turn up the gas and do the short stuff as well. Talk yeah, us sure. Some so of the, uh... Yeah, I'd love to. Um, yeah. Oh, my gosh. All right. I'll blow my trumpet and then I'll settle down. So, yes, I am the only man in the world to have won the Grand Slam, which is uh, the Olympic Distance World Championship Duathlon World Championship, uh, 70.3 or Long Distance World Championship and Ironman. So we'll, okay, we'll quit while I'm ahead. Never won the Tui Series or the F1 St. George Series because Brad Bevan was just unbeatable. Yeah. However, I never lost an Enduro format race. 
And those races were ahead of its time. The Bray Boys came up, online sports promotions, OSP, they came up with this series that was just incredible and heavily backed, great sponsorship, took 25 guys and 15 women around Australia. We raced in the middle of velodromes. We put a pool in the middle of the velodrome in Adelaide and Perth. We ran around the apron. We rode on the thing there, no fixed gears. We had gears, which is crazy. Our cranks were hitting the boards. Mike Turner from South Australia Australia was going through the roof because we're probably damaging those boards at the same time. <laughs> Mate, our hearts were in our mouths. I mean, our heart rates were 190s, 200s, you know, for, for five or six of these years. You will never see a better series than that. The online sports promotions guys, they put on something that was well ahead of its time, and I don't ever think it'll be done again. Um, Mac is trying to do something, you know, in Europe and around the world, you know, with the Super League, and yeah. congrats to him because that's that's as close as you'll ever get to it. Um, and then we had, you know, just you know, just races everywhere. You know, you you mentioned it, Johnny, going up and down the promenade at Manly with twenty five thousand spectators just. Yeah cheering you on it just it takes you up to another level you, you're swimming out there this one day we were swimming in eight foot surf i mean it was just nuts like you know leachy and rito and all those guys used to do in the uncle toby's and and the mercer boys did in the kellogg series man you're talking about this is not so stuff right you, you're wading out in waist deep water and then there's a trough you've got to go underneath you've got to grab the bottom of the ocean there you've got to hang on for dear life while that monster of water you know just goes right over the top of you you come out of the water you look like sigmund the sea monster and you've got <laughs> you know bloody seaweed hanging off you and you've got you got a package full of sand in them, <laughs> which wasn't really comfortable running in but my yeah it was awesome racing and those races on the velodrome i gotta tell you we did it at night time was prime time live on tv you know channel 10 they had the foresight you know to put this on and actually see that australia they wanted to see this in their living rooms we were household names and it was absolutely fantastic running around in our speedos and a velodrome <laughs> on our bikes at 10 o'clock at night it was fantastic. So I can, I we remember, did a lot of great stuff. I remember some of those like crazy bike courses, like just like it was like a, it was like a car park with like a, a maze, and you had such tight turns. And I remember Chapman, you know, Chapman was trying to like go around the corner, and there was cra it was like there were crashes in the, in the triathlon. Crashes was, everywhere. Johnny, crashes everywhere. Johnny, Johnny said a best at Panthers, right? We, he was dead right. You put like this Formula One circuit in this, um, or like a criterium circuit. It's probably best, uh, you know, that's the best analogy is a, a criterium circuit at a pub pu car park. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, so I remember Chapo, you know, we were all like bunny hopping like gutters and, yeah. you know, just to stay out of the way. I remember that race, um, Johnny, uh, was the final race of the year. Uh, it was the finale, and Brad was in the lead, and I, I had to win the race outright to win the series. Um, they came down to the last race. It was three races, and in the last race, Tim Bentley, he rode a, he a TT bike. He had a disc wheel on the back. Was it Tim Bentley? No, no. Andrew Noble rode a bike with a disc wheel on the back. He rolled his tyre because he didn't have enough glue on there. Tim Bentley went over the top of him, and I went over the top of both of them. In the last race and broke both of my wrists oh, now geez. the following weekend i had scheduled my honeymoon that we'd put off from about six months before to go to hamilton island so i went up there with two arms in casts oh no <laughs> oh no <laughs> and lost I the series say, in Greg, that second <laughs> yeah well when i could get to the live ones manly penrith you know, that was epic. When I couldn't, obviously, Bill Woods did a wonderful job bringing that whole theatre to life, and I thought he did a wonderful job. But there's also some yeah. international um, athletes who came along as well. So Spencer Smith was also, uh, what was the chap, the, the amazing swimmer, uh, Sam, Sam, Benjamin oh, Sampson? Yeah, Sampson, yeah. You had Benjamin the French guy. Sampson, yet. French. Yeah, you had Hamish Carter, the Olympic champion from, from New Zealand. You had Frank Clark from Canada. You had Glenn Magnum from the USA. Scott Tinley did some of them. Mark Allen did some of them. We had Darren Wood from the USA. It was a global field. And uh, Wes Hobson. Um, so, yeah, these guys just used to love this. And they're like, how can we get this back in the States? How can we get this into Europe? And they just wanted to be a part of it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I remember Robo. Do you remember Robo run with those sticks? 
Yeah. <laughs> he'd pick up his sticks. There'd be a couple of women that uh, run with the sticks as well. And, you know, and then you'd have, you'd have Macca just, you know, yelling at everyone. And uh, he's like, come on, let's work at you blokes. And <laughs> stop being a lazy ass and all this. And then, yeah, Spencer would be crunching together. I remember at Manly, uh, Johnny and Dave, that we come around this one corner. It was a hairpin, right? So we did, we call it the hot dog because you go up around the other end of the sausage, you do a 90, right. sorry, 180 degree, and you come back and you do it again in front of the crowd. Spencer come around this corner at the at the uh, end where the crowd was, and he was still in the big gear. Stands up and he was that strong. He put the pedal to the metal and broke his chain. He snapped that chain, and yes, he landed on the top bar. Uh, not good. <laughs> not good. Well, when you were telling that story about the hill at the old course in Kona, that happened exactly to me going up that last hill. <laughs> I was like. Stood on my pedals and just, yeah, snapped. Sorry. Landed oh, on the dear. crossbar. Not good. Not a good yeah. look. So One let's gonna, we're going to, we're going to start wrapping this up. But Greg, what, what would, what would your advice be to some young folk that are kind of starting their sporting career? And what, what are like the three things that you would say, you know, think about this? Yeah. I mean, you know, you can take the title from Johnny's book or you can take persistence or you can take just have fun, get out there and have fun. Let fun be the first part of it because that's how it was for me. Um, it was all about the social life at the time because I had no aspirations of doing anything, you know, in the world of triathlon because I didn't know about it at the time. I'd just seen this crazy sport on TV on the wide world of sports, you know. Um, it was Patrick Lindsay and Chuck Stewart, you know, rest in peace Chuck, but they brought it to us and uh, Mike Gibson and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ian Maurice and right. uh, Max, uh, you know, the, the bowler. Walker. Walker. His last name. Max yeah. Walker with the big, big moustache, just like Merv. Um, they brought it to us and I, I, I don't know, I just got into it because of that. So let it be fun first. And then if you've got aspirations, if you've got goals, set them. Um, and, and achieve them by doing as much as you need to do without overdoing it. Because a lot of people can overdo it. Um, don't leave any stone unturned. Work hard because, um, you know, the only way you're going to make progress is working hard. It doesn't matter uh, if it's in schoolwork or in daily life, but uh, if you work hard, you will be rewarded for it. That's awesome. Well, I'm going to wrap it up there, guys. Um, Greg, we will get you back. Hey, who else do you think we should get on this show just as, like, as we build this, who who you can get nominate the next two or three people that we need to bring on this show? Oh, look, the best guy to have a chat with is Craig Alexander. I mean, you know, he he's he loves to chat. We've got lots of great stories. He's got a <laughs> ton of stories. He's absolutely fantastic. And if you want to hear it on the global level, that's a guy that's won five world championships. Right? He's won three in Kona at the Ironman distance, two seventy point three world championships. And he's globally loved. He's an absolute uh, icon throughout the world, and he's a great chat. Awesome. Well, also a Cronulla boy. Also a Cronulla boy. Still lives down there in Carring Bar. We, we, our houses were about, I want to say, about 800 metres apart. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah. So great Aussies. Hey, Johnny, any final words before we wrap? Yeah, well, she thanks so much for being an inspiration to me. Um, as, I, as I mentioned in the little chat uh, today, that watching you cross that line and obviously doing that famous leap in the air and, and flying the flag really motivated me to kind of think maybe I could do the same one day. So thanks to you for all that you've done in the sport of triathlon. Uh, you're a dear mate. Uh, one of the things that resonates when I was inducted into the Hall of Fame, I was very humbled and felt very uncomfortable you recall i said to you that it shouldn't be going to me it should go to you because you're my mentor idol and you said it's your time mate mine will come and it did so um thanks again for being such a such a great mate and i look forward to catching up when we can fly again awesome yeah, guys thanks, man thank yeah, you thank very you. much i'm sure we'll have you back thanks for the tips uh okay to everybody out there like get off your ass and go do something have fun with it <laughs> thanks Walshie. thanks guys appreciate it